a lot of my students have graduated and they have not found jobs or they've started practices and had to struggle, but they have found ways to succeed and maintain their principles. Episode 99. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we talk with the world's leading architects and consultants about how to create the architecture practice of your dreams, a practice that is both impactful, successful, and profitable. If you believe that great design can go hand in hand with financial reward, that profit and design are not mutually exclusive, that money, art, and social responsibility can peacefully coexist, then you are in the right place. Welcome to the business of architecture. This episode is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. Want to give them a huge thanks for supporting the show and furthering the mission of the business of architecture. As you know, ArchiOffice is a project and financial management tool specifically for architects. It's very well aligned to the mission of business of architecture here, which is to help you run a more profitable practice so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on living out your passion, creating beautiful design, and having a fulfilling and successful practice. As always, if you want to be famous, I would appreciate a rating over on iTunes. Leave a review over there. I'll read your comment out over the air, good or bad, to the thousands of business of architecture faithful. Now, I want to add a new element to the show here to make it more interactive, but it's up to you because what I'd like to do is I'd like you to send me your most pressing questions about the business of architecture so I can answer them here on the show. To do that, send an email to questions at businessofarchitecture.com. I will answer those here on the air so that others can benefit from the questions and the answers. Today, I continue my conversation with one of America's greatest living architects, Frank Harmon, FAIA. In this interview, he shares the lessons he's learned from 40 plus years about running a successful and a fulfilling architecture practice. Well, I was just going to say, what would you say to architects or young architects that are struggling to make ends meet, where the the cash flow and the funds feel like they necessitate taking on projects that they don't necessarily believe in from an aesthetic say, or I'll architectural? Just say, no, don't do it. And how do you survive? Start a restaurant. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, um, don't do it. Uh, that, that, you, you <laughs> Um, you know, we've had a really tough six years since 2008, right? Yep. And a lot of my students have graduated and they have not found jobs or they've started practices and had to struggle, but they have found ways to succeed and maintain their principles. Frank, you've been practicing for possibly over 40 years. Mm Mm-hmm. And during that time period, you did just mention that even with your wealth of experience and time in the industry, that the past six years have been very difficult. What's your perspective on the recession? How did it compare to previous times? And how did it affect your firm? Well, you know, if you're in practice for any length of time, you're going to go through recessions. They happen every eight to 10 years. And this is the one in 2008 was my third recession, and it's by far the worst. I can't think of anything worse since the Depression in 1936. It was by far the worst. Um, the unemployment of my architects in North Carolina was over 30%. It was a really tough time. As a result, firms that are hiring now, and typically your, your prime <laughs> person to hire has got five or six years of experience, well, they aren't out there. (laughs) So it's an interesting time. Well, when you saw that recession happening, what was it like from your perspective, seeing that unravel? When did you realize that this was not just a temporary blip, that something serious was happening here? And what was that like as an owner of a firm? 
Well, I had just gotten an iPhone, and there was an app on it that tracked the stock market. And you would open up the app and find out that the stock market had fallen 12% that day. That was a pretty good indicator. <laughs> <laughs> Thing. But I was actually very fortunate. I had just put, gotten under contract two very large projects that kept me going for the next three or four years. Excellent. Did you I, have to I lay off staff? Um, I didn't never laid anybody off, but they they some left, and I didn't rehire. Um, you know, I, I had won a competition, and I had also gotten a contract to do a, a large church. And the church, to their credit, I mean, it was pretty hard raising the funds during that period, but they did, you know. So you were able to pull through with the help of those two larger projects? That was a big help. Yeah. And how are things, well, I mean, six years, that still is a large time. Was that truly enough to pull you through? Uh, it was for three or four years of that, but since then we have found other work. We've had some very devoted clients. I can't be thankful enough for the clients that I've had. And, um, you know, right now we've got four clients. Um, well, you know, four, four sort of intensely ongoing projects right now. And um, all of whom I'd like to have dinner with. Frank, on, on your that's website. Another piece, that's another piece of advice I could give to young architects. Is what is that? Your, client, your clients need to be the sort of people you like to have dinner with. Why is that? Because you're going to have a lot in common and you'll trust each other. What are the consequences of not trusting each other that you've seen? I uh, inevitably results in bad work. I've had clients who've trusted me and there's. And because of that, there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. There's nothing, you know, it's just um, go to every length to make sure they get a good project. I have other clients who don't trust me, and and it's it's a lot more difficult to do things well. Yeah. Because they, they, can't, they can't always accept your advice. You know? Yeah. Have you found any strategies for helping clients like that be more trusting that you use? Call them every Friday. Yes. <laughs> yes. You got to keep communication open. For That's a, that, you know, yeah. Communication is what we're all about. Communication and education. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think uh, young architects starting out. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had a, a mentor. His name is Harwell Hamilton Harris. He was a truly wonderful architect. And I actually met him when I moved down to North Carolina. I had always studied his work, but I actually got to meet him. And he used to say that, you, you know, it, a, a good building comes from a good client. And if you don't get a good client, you have to turn him into a good client. <laughs> And what that means is you need to educate your clients into what you're doing and why it's valuable for them. So besides the Friday phone calls, how does it, how would you suggest an architect educate their clients? Uh, well, you know, the, the first and most important thing that you do is you have to listen to them to find out what they're really interested in. And you don't always hear that. Um, a lot of people are rather shy about asking for what they really want because they think they won't get it. Mm. <laughs> um, and so I think um, if you can find a way to understand what motivates your client, is it status, is it comfort, is it privacy, they won't always tell you that. <laughs> But if you can find out what that is, then you've got something that you can work with. One of the questions I typically ask my clients is, what was their favorite childhood place? And what did it feel like when you were there? And if a client, not, not every client can answer that, especially the men. But if they can, I know I've got something I can build on. 
for example, uh, I had a client, and his he came from this large, argumentative, boisterous family of merchants. And his favorite place as a child was underneath the staircase in his parents' house, where he could kind of hide out, but still be very much part of what was going on. And my client is a, not a tall person, rather compact. And as a result, you know, the design that we came up with was of relatively small, intimate spaces that were interconnected where you could both choose to be part of what was going on, but you could also withdraw if you needed to. So um, if a client can answer that, that gives you something wonderful to build on. But the, the hard, if you take a house, for example, the hardest thing often is for people to ask for what they want. They, it's much easier for them to, to, to ask for what they think somebody else wants. For example, you'll often hear, well, I really don't want a formal dining room, but what about the resale value? Mm -hmm. And so I'll say, well, okay, so you're going to design your house for the next person who's going to live there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's things like that, trying to find out what the person really wants that is going to make it the most successful. Are there any other questions that come off the top of your head that are useful besides the question, obviously the powerful question about your favorite room as a child? Any other questions that help you in that process of discovering what it is your clients truly want? Well, if we're talking residential design, I mean, almost everybody has got a notebook of images and things they put together about what they like. Uh, Hows is a very big uh, resource out there these days. And I always love to look at those. I don't feel bound by them, but, you know, it's fascinating to look at what people think. Here's the thing. It is really hard to know what an environment's like from looking at a photograph. The best source I have is to ask my client, where's a house that you lived or that you really like that we can go to see together? That That's invaluable. Um, so that that's another resource. I, anyway, I, I always like looking at the notebooks. And then I, if it's a house, I always make it a point of visiting the owner in their current house to see what that's like. Yep. And, of course, I tell them not to clean up the house, but they always do. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it like it's lived in. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the important thing. You know, where do you put your magazines? Where do you leave the crossword puzzle? And, you know. <laughs> Frank, in the interview that Catherine sent over, uh, it says that you are, um, well, first of all, it doesn't mention the word architect, calling you an architect, but it does introduce you as an educator, a writer, and an illustrator. And I find that's interesting that that you've positioned yourself for that those words represent you you know writing illustrating and um you know engaging people and educating do you yeah. find yourself to be primarily an educator or primarily an architect that educates the latter i think the two are interchangeable mm -hmm. as i was saying earlier the only way to make sure that architecture is an improvement over what we already have is that you need to educate people into what it can do. Yep. You no. Know, uh, inevitably, everything we do is about educating people. Yeah. And you have two other ventures that were mentioned, nativeplaces.org and Activate14. Yep. Could you tell me about each of those and what they represent? Activate14 is a... Uh, a public resource about architecture and design. We came, you know, we, we moved into this building about a little over two years ago. It's the new Center for Architecture and Design for North Carolina AIA. And we, did, we decided that the building could be activated, if you will, to become more of a resource for public discussion about design, landscape, cities, housing, homelessness. So we established this series of events in 2014 and we decided to call it Activate 14 because our address is also 14 
East P Street. So that, that became the name for it. And uh, over the last year, we've held a number of events. We've held two design competitions. We've just fielded a, another design competition. It's very interesting. It's called uh, Tiny Homes as a Response to Homelessness. It's getting a lot of attention. So it's a series of events, sometimes all-day events here uh, at the Center for Architecture and Design, sometimes competitions. Uh, it's a way of extending the outreach of architecture, but it, it does come back to the theme of education. You know, any, any good architect like Glenn Murcutt, what he does adds to the common commonwealth of architecture and design that we can learn from. I would say that would be another principle about designing something. You should design something that's going to add to the commonwealth of good design, of good buildings, that other people can see and learn from. Maybe not immediately, but 10 or even 50 years from now. Look at what I've learned from the way some family in rural South Carolina put a porch on their building and where they planted their pole beans. I mean, so um, being able to give back is part of what we do. This, this has been true since the time of Vitruvius, you know. Mm -hmm. Vitruvius' principles were that you should do buildings that were sound and firmly built and delightful. But he also felt like that every architect ought to publish what he did so that others could learn from it. So, it, you know, it's not a new idea. I think today perhaps we, we don't pay as much attention to it yeah. as we should. Frank, this, this show is Business of Architecture. And, you know, even though it does share the, 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 um, the acronym with Bank of America, we aren't all about the money here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we realize that uh, to run a successful architecture practice, business is a necessary part of doing that. And just in terms of your experience as a business owner, but also someone that's, you know, how do you reconcile those two? The, the need to run a profitable business and at the same time have higher motivations than just money? Well, the three go together. The best advice I can give is to have a good lawyer and a good accountant and have them on your speed dial. Great advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting a good accountant changed the way I look at things. Um, and How so? How did lawyer, it change? Uh, well, it gave, you know, it, it's very hard to be focused on a design if you have anxieties about cash flow. You can't do both. One, one is going to neg negate, you know. So being on top of your cash flow and your receivables um, every month is invaluable. It gives you a certain uh, equanimity that allows you to really focus on what's important. So that's one. Secondly, we live in a litigious world. And uh, I have a lawyer who's become a close friend who's advised me for 25 years. Mm. And if an issue comes up, I can call him right away. By the way, I also learned, I learned that from Richard Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Richard, Richard had a really good, I mean, we'd be sitting in the office one day and some client would call up and say, Richard, you know, this glass roof is causing us to get overheated in the house. And we've asked you about this many times and you've done nothing. We're going to sue you. <laughs> and, and Richard would sort of say, well, thank you. I'll be back in touch and hang up and he'd say, well, I think it's time to go to lunch. <laughs> and, uh, I'll just call my lawyer. <laughs> well, that was part of his equanimity, if you're, you know, that I referred to earlier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So yeah. have a good lawyer, have a good, have a good accountant. Is there any other challenge particularly yes. that, that is, that about comes to mind for you for running a practice? About the business end? Yeah, about the thing? business end of things. Well, you want to hire people that are better than you are. How do you find That's them? Right. Well, I'm a teacher, so it helps. Yeah. yeah. 
um, for several years, I got really good people from Kansas State University, believe it or not. I mean, that's a thousand miles from here. How do you recruit um, and how did you find people in Kansas? I knew someone who taught there and he would recommend people to okay. me. So you have a network of teachers that are working with students. Absolutely. About, about three or four years ago, I needed some good people. So I called my architect buddies in different parts of the country and said, do you, have you, do you know of anyone? Mm -hmm. yeah. But that, that's really important. And as a result, I've started three really good practices here in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> By, by people who used to work for me. So. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So you've you've actually been able to have um, be a, uh, I guess, an incubator for future. Yes, and, uh, you know, if we look at our lives as educators or people who are adding to the public good, that's another way to do it. It's mm -hmm. not only through good buildings. Yep. You know? Yep. I've also been the administrative architect for. Uh, some very good projects done by other architects. That's another way. You know, uh, about 20 years ago, a client asked me to find her an architect to build a daycare center and um, a, a school for children with emotional difficulties. And I found W.G. Clark for her and, and worked with W.G. to design the building. So even though it's not my building, I feel like that I've made a difference in the world supporting this very good architect. You know. Well, it's a very collaborative approach. Yeah, that, and I have one other piece of advice that's essential, which is to, uh, if you can, marry a landscape architect. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, which, is, no. which is what I did. I married a landscape architect and... Um, you know, it, it is a fact that every building starts with the site. In fact, around here, we like to say that the site is the building. And landscape architects have this wonderful ability to see what's important about the place where you're building. And it becomes a sort of a seamless combination of building and site in that way. So it is a fact that all the projects that we do, we like to work with landscape architects. So Judy Harmon is your wife, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, well, she is deceased. She died two years ago. Okay. And how much input, did, was she an active input in the projects? Did you practice together or? Well, she had her own practice with her own clients, um, but we would collaborate on certain things. For example, the North Carolina Pottery Center was fundamentally a landscape design. And that's always been a very successful project because we got the landscape and the siting just right. We work together on our own house, uh, which I've already described. Yeah. Um, and uh, we did another project, uh, and, uh, some offices for a child psychologist. That's a very successful combination of buildings and landscape. I've also worked with uh, Greg Bleem in Charlottesville, Virginia, and David Swanson in Chapel Hill. Currently, we like to work with Eric Davis in Durham. His firm is called Surface. So it, it's a really key collaboration. Uh, another, and these are, by the way, things that I also learned from Richard Meyer. Uh, Richard Meyer hired the best consultants he could get. Mm. And I would recommend that because, as Richard said, you know, if I hire the best consultants, they're going to make me look good. Mm -hmm. So he had Fred Severin as a structural engineer. Um, he had Joe Ganjimi as his landscape architect. Um, if you look at Richard's work, it's technically extremely competent, and his landscapes are generally beautiful. So that's another principle that, that I had learned from him. Frank, you mentioned Glenn Murcutt. Would it be possible for you to provide an introduction? Introduce me to Glenn. Sure. Be glad to. Uh, he, he doesn't answer the telephone. He doesn't have internet. So you have to use a, a, a carrier pigeon. <laughs> I was about to say, I mean, do we get him on shortwave pigeon. radio or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. I'll be glad to. Yeah. Back in school when I, I did a project and one of the architects said it reminded him of a, a Glenn Murcutt project. And ever since then, 
I've looked at his work and and really admired the the vernacular sensibility of it. Um, mm-hmm. But then also, I see that you take a lot of the same cues from the vernacular architecture. Yeah, and no, there's a man, for example, who's closely studied Aboriginal dwellings in Australia. I mean, he's a great student. Mm-hmm. And when I traveled with him in America, it was remarkable how he would notice barns and outbuildings and uh, granaries and uh, even satellite dishes. He was because of the lessons that they could teach you. I've always been intrigued by people that have been able to take uh, utilitarian projects like a fertilizer shed and turn them into something that's unique. When you think about it, um, there's a great advantage of that because people don't have any expectations. Mm. They don't know what it should look like, Mm -hmm. which can often be an impediment if people already know what they think it should look like. Uh, that's another piece of advice I would give to young architects is to choose projects that are often overlooked. The year I did the utility shed, uh, I entered it in the North Carolina or Southeastern, you know, AIA mm-hmm. comp- uh, prize program. And um, I remember going to the award ceremony and there was a, a John Portman uh, hotel that was... 60 stories high and cost yeah. millions of dollars. And here was my little fertilizer shed, which cost $75,000 <laughs> <laughs> and was 24 feet high. And I remember telling John Portman that I was just as proud of my building as he was of his. And he understood that. Yeah. You know? So there, I would say to young architects, don't be afraid of taking on small projects. You know, Frank, as you were talking about that and talking about the award, something did come to mind, which is there seems to be a belief among architects that if you do great work, that publicity will come. What's your viewpoint on that? And that clients and projects will come to you. Do you believe that? Or how necessary is promotion and actively submitting for awards and putting yourself out there necessary? Oh, I have never had a client come to me because I had done an award building building. Never. Um, I do awards programs because I think it's important to share the knowledge of what we do. Whenever we can, for example, we put all of our construction documents on our website so that people can see them and use them if they want to. So I think that's the primary reason. I, but I, I cannot tell you that I've ever had a project that came to me because I was an award winning architect. That's just the way the world works, you know. So would you fall would you say you'd fall on the side of do great work and projects will come or Absolutely. Build it and they will come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they won't come because it wins an award. And when you think about it, people want a building that makes them happy. And very few people are gonna be made happy by getting an award. They're gonna be made happy because the sunlight comes in on their cup of coffee on a chintz tablecloth in the morning. Yep. And that they can go outside without, you know, having to put a coat on. Yep. So that's what they're interested in. Well, I'd like to encourage our listeners to go to your website, uh, frankharmon.com. And on there, Frank, you do have construction drawings. Great resource for anyone yes. who'd like to see. And this is interesting, too, is that you actually, I haven't seen any architecture firms actually put true construction documents online. You actually have mm-hmm. some real building details, sections, elevations and yes. plans of some mm-hmm. of your buildings on, on your site. Yes. Yep. So they can download that on the resources um, link on frankharman.com. That's correct. Thanks again, Frank. All right. Thank you. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The 
views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.